Welcome to Beyond My Crisis. I'm your host, Ron Rosnick. And I'm Vivian Gaspar. Today we have Kim Tuan Manella. She is a survivor of the Khmer Rouge Cambodian Genocide War, which ended in 1979. As a refugee of war, she made it to America at the age of nine, not speaking a word of English. She is also a survivor of domestic violence, has thrived, and is now a successful CEO and founder of a consulting company. She believes that her strife and domestic violence are events from her past, which do not define who she is. She has a passion to help others out of their abuse and to make what seems impossible, possible. It is amazing how much courage you've demonstrated essentially your entire life. It must feel wonderful, and thank you so much for being with us here today to be a shining example that just because you've gone through some really unfortunately difficult situations, it does not need to define you the rest of your life. Well, thank you for having me here. Yeah. I appreciate that and allowing me to get my message out today. Very important. So what, how did you make it through all of this strife? What, what was in your mind during these times? Well, if I can just go back just a little bit sure. to the past, uh, and uh, I'll just make it really short, is that I am a survivor of the Khmer Rouge genocide, and this was a uh, ethnic war, ethnic cleansing. So people are familiar with the Holocaust. Yes. They did something very similar to that. Almost and two million people were killed. Yeah, and, and we say almost two million because there's still no records of how many people lost their lives. Systematically, they were murdered doing this. And I was just a child at that time. How old were you? I was a, anywhere between, uh, I was, it started at five, and by the time the war ended in 1979, I was um, nine years old. And um, we were in school one day, we were learning, things were thriving, and next thing you know, we've got new people taking over, and we couldn't wear color anymore. We had to wear black, and we had to cut our hair short, and we had to do different salutes, and we were just not allowed to go to school anymore. We were given ax and, and um, machete to go clear wood. And they separated the, the mom from the dad, the boy from the girl, the, all different separations and into the group. So I, I guess I was put into a concentration camp type of thing. Yes. And it's all different groups. And these were all systematic. And this is why they were able to sis kill so many people in such a short period of time. And how yeah. did you survive this then? By sheer luck, I believe that there's a reason why certain things we just do not perish, right? Um, my mom and dad, we got shot at multiple times. We got shot at from the cannon. We got shot at from the helicopter. And we were in trenches. And I even got a cut here from a machete during that time as part of in the wartime. And I'm meant to live this long to help other people. Uh, that's the only thing that's I could say. Great, which is part of your mission, yeah. Yeah. to make the impossible possible for victims of domestic exactly. violence and other types of abuse. Right, so I know what it's like to be so hungry and be so scared and not know which way to go. And we escaped from there. We went to Thailand a lot on foot. I mean, one day I'm going to write a book about it. But <laughs> we escaped into Thailand, and unfortunately, I lost my sister at that time. Your younger sister. My younger sister due to starvation and disease. And around that time, the United States had uh, some act that they were passing. And because of this act, uh, we were allowed to go into different country as part of refugee of war. And this is how, through a lottery system, I ended up in the U.S. You are definitely a survivor and an example for other people Thank that you. are in a situation that may seem hopeless. We'll be right back, and we're going to talk about how to know if you're in an abusive situation and what you can do to start uplifting yourself. Roughly half of Americans are concerned about their financial well-being. Nearly a third of Americans have less than $10,000 in savings. Last year, 77% of taxpayers believe they benefited from using a professional tax preparer. Are you worried about your financial situation? It only takes one snowflake to cause an avalanche. Don't let taxes sneak up on you this season. Kendall Ludden, CPA, tax preparer and refund strategist. Welcome back to Beyond My Crisis. We're here with Kim, and she's been telling us this amazing story of courage escaping the horrible genocides in Cambodia. But when you came to America, please tell us what happened next with your family. Sure, we came into America. It's a great land. Everybody wants to come to America to this day. I'm not surprised. 
But when we came to America, I didn't speak any words of English. I was nine years old, and I was the butt of every, everybody's joke. And the Asians were the community that came in sort of after the Italians, the French, and the Irish. So a lot of racism was toward the Asian people. So I don't think I'm an unpleasant person or a mean person, but because I was different, there was so much racism. They used to follow me home just to tell me to go back to China. And, and this is in California. This is in California. And I keep saying to them, look, I'm not from China, and other times they say, go back to Japan. I'm from neither countries. And thankfully today <laughs> we see in towns there's signs, stigma-free town, yeah. which kind of reinforces that we have to be more accepting of people. Absolutely. How did you get through the, the stigmas that you were? Well, I had to like develop, learn how to talk tough. I had to swear like a sailor. <sighs> and I also told a lie. I said to them, look. I am a cousin of Bruce Lee. He's my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. Okay. And you became a, a martial artist, too. I, I, I am. Today, I am a martial artist. But at the time, I said, look, my cousin is Bruce Lee. And at that time, in the 80s, he was very popular. I said, if you don't stop beating me up, I'm going to call him. And he's coming to the school. And he's going to take care of you. And we and all Bruce Lee back then. It did. It really helped. <laughs> that was very smart. I so, fake yeah. a couple of moves, and they believed me, and they left me alone. Oh, oh finally. Very That's smart. Good. But then something else happened. You, yeah. at 17 years old, Old, yeah, you I grew up, up getting married. Yes, I did, and and that's because my father died of brain aneurysm. He oh. died very, un, you know, suddenly he died. He had a business and it was thriving, and he had this brain aneurysm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It can hit you at any time. Yeah. There's no warning signs, and he died very suddenly, and it just sort of destroyed all of us. When you were 17. When I was 16. Oh. You were 16. And, and and my mom was now left with five children speaking not very much English because my father took care of everything and now she had to take care of all of us. And so in the Cambodian tradition is that marrying young through arranged marriage is not an uncommon thing. Actually, sure. it's still practiced today in India, yeah. but in the Indian community, this is supported. You have the whole village. If yes. anybody does anything it wrong, village to raise. <laughs> <laughs> you get grandma, grandpa coming with a stick. Yes. Um, that wasn't the case for me. My mom did an arranged marriage, picked this gentleman to marry me, and he seemed like the ideal guy. Um, Cambodian very kind, also. Cambodian yeah. also, yeah. He went and prayed at my grave. That was the tradition. He said, I'm, I'm going to take care of, at my father's grave, I'm going to take care of you, my, your daughter. I'm, I don't drink. I don't hit women. I don't smoke. I don't do this. I don't do that. So I believed it. And then he convinced me to move to Massachusetts, which and, where I live and today. what happened there? Well, this is where all the abuse started. The first year was, everything was great. <clears throat> But then after my daughter was born, she was two months old. This is when he showed his true sign. And what was that? What did that look like? Well, we got into an argument. I just had a C-section. Um, you know, when you have a C-section, your body's not strong. The mm -hmm. staples just got removed. The stitches aren't really close right. together. And one thing led to another. Next thing I know, he jumped on me on top of the bed. He pinned me down with two of my shoulders, and he proceeded to punch me. I mean, wow. continuous punching, punching, punching. And my daughter was just next to me, and she was, was crying. Your daughter in the bed? She was on the bed, oh, and she, she was, was crying. She was two months yeah, old. Sure. And, and I didn't know what to do. I wish I know certain moves to take to get out of that, but I didn't, so he just had his way. And how long did that abuse last? It lasted over, that was the first. You know, he, he did the stripping of taking away my confidence, taking away my uh, social security card so I couldn't go back home to my mom. He, he said things like, if you call the cops, I'm going to make sure you're dead. I'm going to make sure you're in the body bag if you ever call the cops. So this sort of continued for six years. Well, so did you, he do anything that was controlling? Because I know that's he frequently... Did. He did. He, he, he would say, you can't drive until you're 25. You, I, I'm not giving back your social security card. You can't go anywhere. So I had wherever I go, I had to go with him. But what I used to do is, because I love knowledge, I would wait for him to sleep because he worked third shift. And when he sleeps, that is when I take my daughter and we walk to the library. And, and we would just do this a lot. And sometimes he wakes up and we're gone. He's freaking out. And he's sometimes he's coming after us, driving like a crazy person and stopping right there about that much before, you know, just a threatening way about and to hit me. And he had an army knife. Um, he's not in the army, but he had an army knife that he shot him so sharp that you could split hair. And he used to take the back of the blade and he used to hold it. And he's like, look, you see how this is? 
it, your, people's neck is easy as easy to cut as it is a chicken's neck. So he used that to scare me, and it worked. Intimidation, yes. Oh, yeah. Intimidation, fear tactics. So the fear circle tactics. of violence is not just physical <clears throat> harm. It's feeling threatened, yeah. taking money away, control. Complete control. Well, I was about to ask you, did he do anything to oversee? Did you do the shopping, or did he control the money in the house? I, I did the shopping. He controlled some of the money, but not all of it. But he would do things to sabotage interviews. Like, I, I wanted to go to school. Uh, after high school, and I fought him hard to go. Right. No matter what, I was willing to take whatever he was going to give me and just go to school. And then he sabotaged a couple of my interviews because he didn't want me to work. Because the thing with abusers is if, if you can have your victim have no means of education, have no means of friends, have no means of family support, and have no way of making money, they control ultimately everything. Right. So the big question before we take our next break is, sure. how did you escape from this? Well, I have to say that um, it was a blessing in disguise. Uh, you can call it divine intervention. Um, I, your gut feel is the most important thing. And everybody out there needs to understand that you need to trust your gut. If your intuition says you're in danger, trust it. You are in danger. And for me, that morning when he came home from work, sharpening meat cleavers and getting ready to pack another one, that's when I said, oh my gosh, get the heck out of here now. Kim, let's take a break and find out exactly how Kim was able to escape this horrific situation with her now ex-husband. Anytime you can come into court and file for a change if there's a change of circumstances. We give an hour free consult. It's confidential. Find out what has to be done. We're back here with Kim, who was just describing how she was living a hellish life in an abusive relationship with a young child. And Kim, um, you were saying, you got out of this from how? What was the turning point of well, this? Well, you just see it in somebody's eyes when, when they're ready to do something drastic. And I saw it in his eyes. And you said something really important that I think all of our audience should really know. When you're feeling abused, there's something in your gut yeah. that we have to listen to yeah. and, and get out of it. I mean, personally, I was in a situation of domestic violence and wow. my ex-wife physically assaulted me and, and did a lot of things. I have a final restraining order with her today. Mm -hmm. And um, I can understand that. But men as well That's right. are victims of domestic violence. And even we are apprehensive to try to do anything. It's, there's a stigma about men getting yeah. out of that. So uh, I could relate to what you're saying as a man. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, thank it, you for sharing that. It's just incredible that first you had to survive as a very young child this horrific genocide. You came to America, you saw the light, and only to get into this situation. So I really commend your bravery thank you. and courage to take you and your, your daughter out of that. So what were the steps that occurred? Well, um, I actually, because it got so bad, I kept this to myself for the six years duration because I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, and I felt people didn't understand. I was ashamed that he was doing this to me, and I was ashamed that I let it happen to me. So I didn't say anything and go to anybody until I was very desperate. So I went to my managers at work, and they saw my mannerism. It was different. I was quiet, and, and um, they started saying, what's going on? What's going on? Can we help? Can we help? And because they did that, I opened up and told them exactly what happened. And I say this is sort of a, a grace of God, angel on earth. There were, I had a, an employer, I call him Grumpy, affectionately. He's mm -hmm. not at all grumpy, but he loves being a grump, called a Grumpy Scott. And he, he said, Janelle Kim, I have a place that you can go, a safe place you can go when you feel your life is threatened and when you are ready, you are ready to escape, you come back and you let me know and I'll help you. And that was the turning point. And it, when that morning, when he came home with the meat cleaver, and he's getting ready to go to bed and he's packing up another one. I just said, oh my gosh, get out, well, get out, get out, get out. We understand that the statistics are scary. One of the leading cause of women's murder 
is domestic violence yes. gone that unfortunate step too far? So, Absolutely. So you knew this was the moment. So what did you do? You called your... You actually, called grumpy. I, I, I actually grumpy calmly, good. and I don't know. Do you, I, I don't know if you believe, I believe in angels. For me, it was like a voice in my head that says, "Remain calm, calm as can be." When inside, I'm trembling. So I went about putting, uh, taking my daughter to the bus stop. I packed up my stuff, go to work as usual. And that morning, I decided to grab my daughter's bike and stuck it in my car, and I drove like this to work. And when I went into work is when I said, this is what's happening, I gotta get out. I don't believe that I can live past 24 if I don't get out today. And and, and how did you overcome the fear that he was, was not going to hunt you down at oh, this point? Oh, the fear is there, and he did. He did do that. And that day when I packed up and left, I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I had to go. So that day I quit my job. I um, went and took whatever little money I had, spent 30 minutes packing whatever little possessions I had, eight bags, eight bags of trash and dump it into my Volvo. And then um, the bike that I took in the morning, mm -hmm. I gave it to him and that's what he used. Unfortunately, he didn't tell me where we were going. So it was the bike that was the guiding for us as we were coming down on the road on the highway because that was the bike that helped guide us there. But today, we have many more things that we really know what we can do. I mean, yeah. you lived in fear, you exited this relationship in fear mm -hmm. and you were potentially having a threat happen to you. Yeah. But now you have a business that you're consulting people on, you're helping people, you're telling them yeah. what they can do to survive. And we're gonna come back. We're gonna to come back and talk about your business because it's not just that you survived the genocide in Cambodia, not just that you managed to entrust your employer and there is employee intervention that now happened with him, yeah. but then you found the courage to get more education and help other people with their businesses and become completely independent. Right. Yes. So we want to come back and talk about your personal success story. Well, you're, you're brilliant happy also. Now. You're an IT you. inf information technologies consultant, high level, high, high level. Yeah. So you have a great brain. And, um, Thank you. We want to pick that and see how you can help people out there who are victims that need to get out and you Absolutely. have the steps. And you're also in a very happily married situation now, right? I am. Oh, you I, know, You're not one of those that thinks all men are bad because you found no. a wonderful one. Yeah, no, there, there's wonderful men out there and I just by the stroke of luck and timing, my husband, David, is just amazing, wonderful. We've been married now for about 15 years. Oh, and congratulations. We, <laughs> thank you. And, and I wouldn't be where I am without him. And we have two great children. We have a daughter and a son together, so I have three total. And they're thriving. They're, teen, uh, they're pre teens right now. And um, my oldest daughter, the one that saw too much when she was six years old, when I took her away because I wanted to give her options, options mm -hmm. in life, and break the cycle of violence. And um, she's now a registered nurse. Excellent. Wonderful. Yeah. Helping she, people. So. Helping people. And she's worked in a, one of the prominent hospitals in the country. And every single day, she is making an impact on people. Wonderful. Because yeah. that only happened because you found the courage to take both of you out of that exactly. situation. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We're Thank gonna you. come back after this little break. We're back with Kim Tuan Manella talking about how she survived in Cambodia, made it to America, lived through domestic violence, and became a successful entrepreneur, and now is ready to help people with their domestic violence issues. Kim, um, you've got a, a, a lot going on. You've got a business um, called Jim, Jim, how is it pronounced? Well, my, my business name for my information technology consulting company, in which I consult for the state, um, as my client is called Jirani Solutions. Mm -hmm. And Jirani actually is a Cambodian word that translates into rare jewel. Mm. Into rare jewel. Real jewel, that's what it means. And underneath all of that, so I have two passions. I've got one where it's B2B business, doing a lot of information technology, and I, I'm very much involved in the cloud computing space mm -hmm. in, in AWS, Amazon. 
but I also have a personal side. I want to be able to help many people, not just one-on-one, -on -one, but many people make a difference in their life. So I've developed uh, for, this is what I didn't have when I was going through all of this. I didn't have a resource to go like this. There are many shelters, but the program I put together specifically for somebody who's gone through it, like myself. Um, through domestic violence. Domestic violence, and it's called, uh, it's the WILL program, but it stands for Women Impossible Living Life Program. Women Impossible Living Life Program. That's yeah. A, and so do you include, because you said you're a martial artist, yes. which I love, because you want to make sure that you're not going to be a victim again. Exactly. Even by strangers. So do you, as part of your program, to help with some basic self-defense training? Absolutely. So the program in itself has content. It's got instruction. It guides uh, basic things like how do you how do you escape? What are you going through at this moment? It, it, those are just examples, but it's also self development. It's supposed to also help with self confidence building, getting clarity, getting purpose. But I'm also including bonuses on self-defense, like what do you do when you're choked from the front? What do you do when you're choked from the back? These are things I wish I knew. If someone was pinning me down, what do I do to get out of that? Right. And now you it's know and you're going to teach other people. Yes. But if someone's in fear mm -hmm. in a domestic violence situation, they may not want to go on their computer. They may, be, may think their spouse may be watching exactly. or may see a credit card spending or something like that. How can they do this secretly and start connecting with you? Well, there are different ways to do this because I also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching mm -hmm. where I will work with their schedule and help them a different way. So there's no trails. I think it's really important because if the spouse is, is uh, very uh, knowledgeable in the computer, they could go to the last history and see all of the event that's there so, and then potentially harm that right, person. Right, so can I make a suggestion for our sure. viewers? Open an incognito window ah. and then do the search for your website and find you incognito, then close that window and then there won't I be a history that. for that. Thank you'll you. Have to tell, you'll have to figure out how to do that. I don't know how to do well, that. Well, it's under the file menu. You'll see yeah. new window or new incognito window. Ah. In Safari and Google Chrome and that's Firefox, great. it's all there. Um, because I want people to feel like they can do this yeah. in the worst of worst situations. And you've been through the worst of the worst. Um, there's hope and there's a yeah. possibility for an um, incredible life. And that's what you want to give to people. I, I really do. Because I believe domestic violence is only an event. right? It's an event. It doesn't define you. It's not your fault. It's something that just happens, just like any bad things that happen. Um, the key thing is to get out of it. Find a way to get out of it and survive and, and take the actions. Do you give this courage to male and female victims and uh, that it can be heterosexual relationships, homosexual relationships, it doesn't matter. It can happen to everyone. Exactly. The step by step on the most, I think, important things that you said and you said to not have the shame involved in how you look forward right. to eliminate that stigma because it isn't your fault that you didn't ask for it you didn't want it yeah. and how to just clear yourself of that so you can move forward absolutely is there yeah. anything really important that you want to tell our viewers yeah uh, uh, domestic violence doesn't discriminate it doesn't dis discriminate against gender doesn't discriminate against um, uh, lifestyles, career, education, environment, society. It happens and it happens so easily. And subtly sometimes. And subtly, you don't even yeah. recognize it happening when it starts happening. Uh, right, too. because what happens is when, when that person, the, the abuser, gets into that control aspect and they're very good and they're very manipulative and they know the psychological way to trick you. It's almost natural to the abusers. Yeah. They don't get necessarily trained in this. It's just mm. part of their yeah. being. Exactly. And then all of a sudden the person who's being abused starts to question themselves. Uh, maybe I brought this on. Maybe it's because I said this. Maybe I didn't serve dinner on time or maybe I shouldn't have done this. It's my fault. And all of a sudden it becomes the person blames themselves for everything that this individual did and it's hard when you love that person. Oh, when you're yes. in love or when you love that person and this stuff is happening, I can understand you that. can't believe it, you're in shock, you tell yourself this can't be. This I, is the person so I love. You are saying what I have said to myself <laughs> wow. over years of time. So, wow. so does it end when you're divorced? Or no. how do you help people if they find that it's still going on even though they found a way to escape? Once they're divorced, is it all done and over with? No, not at all. Actually, you know, the first year or two are very challenging. You know, and, and I do not want to discourage anybody <laughs> from getting out of a divorce or, or a domestic violence situation, but know what's ahead of you. 
um, you know, when I left, I thought, that's it. I don't have to see him anymore. But I got a shock in the face because I had to constantly face them because I had to go get a restraining order. Temporary restraining order, one-year restraining order, two years, three years. And if you get a permanent, you don't need to do it anymore. But yeah. then there's, if you have children involved, you have child custody, and then there's also the child support aspect. The financial sure. piece. Yeah, and, th and that's huge because if the person who's being victimized has never worked, who didn't, or they went to, let's say they went to college, but they chose to stay home to take care of the family. Yeah. Now they don't have a career, they don't have the skills, they don't have the means to provide for themselves. When they're caught in this situation, now they can't afford a lawyer. <laughs> but even if they did work, that's the, that's really for spousal support. Yeah. Everyone should get child support. I that agree. It has nothing to do with the ability to work and not work. So I completely yeah. agree with what you're saying. But it's being able to enforce that if you're the primary custodial parent, even after a divorce, you have the right to child support. But what happens with these abusers? They still want to hold on to control yeah. post-divorce. Yeah. What do you know about that? And, and it's almost like you're being abused again. It's like you just cannot end this and move on. It's like you got kicked, right? You got kicked, you got run over, and I'm not, I'm just using this in theory. And, and all of a sudden you say, all right, you know what? I finally made the decision. I finally got out. I finally feel safe, right? I finally feel safe. And all of a sudden now you got to go through this whole legal system. And it's all about getting a great lawyer. Right, it's that all getting important. a great lawyer and money. You need money to get a great lawyer to be able to fight for you. Otherwise, you're gonna get dragged through all of that. But not everybody. I want people to know that they have to do this to have a happy yeah. and positive life to, to really impact their children as well. If, you, if they have kids, the reason why should be for the betterment of their kids. Yes. And having the hope that you've had and you made your life and other people have and I have, I mean, everyone can do this. There are things that they're going to do, and the thing is you have to remain strong. You and have to remain strong. strong. I had to remain strong. And too. really important, if you're in that situation, please be thoughtful of your social media. Do not post where you right. are. If you're uh, showing up at a restaurant, don't post you there if you know exactly. that someone's coming after you. Or Keep Yelp safe. or something. Or, yeah. Yeah. Right. And make well, sure don't use credit cards. Don't use credit cards, uh, especially the ones that's shared, right? But uh, you can buy... Um, uh, one prepaid. of these temp prepaid credit cards yes. with your credit card, yep. and then they're not, that's not trackable. Right. right. So, so the key thing is, you know, it's part of the program I'm putting together are these little tricks. And you've got a lot of them. Yeah, it, it's these little tricks. And, and the other thing is, don't use your phone. Don't use your phone. Buy one prepaid. of those cells, a prepaid one, because or if you use your phone. But if you're, and if you're a low-income earner, you can use Simply Safe. Yeah. They'll, uh, oh, the Obama program, former oh, Obama great. program, will give you a free cell phone, and you can use that, and and your spouse won't be able. But to But even track if, because we air in over 25, 30 countries right now, wow. so this is not just about who is in the U.S. And so please remember, so it's not just about the the services you can get yeah. locally. But you know, almost everybody's on Facebook, so just remember to keep yourself incognito off social media. Yep. It's important to stay safe. Unfortunately, that's an easy way to be found by the person who's still obsessing. Yeah. Absolutely, and also, you know, when you first leave that relationship, don't give out your address. If you're going into hiding, don't give out your address. And, and that's and so important. if you important. have a, a restraining order, final restraining order, yeah. you don't have to give your you don't have to use your new address as your driver's license. No, you, you can, can get it impounded. Them. You can tell UPS them that. store address. Yeah, right? I, I, there's ways that you don't have to put your home address down on your vital documents. That's right. With a restraining order. That's oh. true. You can you can have your address impounded by the court, oh, and that's by right. by that term meaning they will not mm -hmm. divulge that information no matter what. Kim, thank you so much for helping yeah. with real life practical information and tips, but also your really inspirational story. And thank you very much for helping our viewers get beyond their crisis with this information. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Beyond My Crisis with Ron and Vivian.